Hi, I'm Jennifer Hollett. I'm the executive director of The Walrus. I am also your host and moderator for the hour. We're really excited to be with you online tonight, bringing people together across the country and beyond in conversation. I always like to start out by acknowledging the land that I'm on in downtown Toronto, Ontario, to Toronto. A land acknowledgement helps us recognize history, thinking about how it informs where we are now and what changes can be made going forward and a commitment to reconciliation or reconciliation. Our offices at the Walrus are located within the bounds of Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas the Credit. This land is also the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Today, Toronto is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We're honored to contribute and build on a great tradition of storytelling, and we welcome you to take a moment to reflect on the land that you're on, wherever you're tuning in from. As part of the ongoing work of reconciliation, if you haven't already or done so recently, we encourage you to read the 94 calls to action recommended by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and we'll drop that link in chat. So a bit about the walrus. The walrus started as an optimistic project over two decades ago to foster conversation across Canada. We recognize that these conversations are complex and necessary, so they take place in many forms of the walrus online at thewalrus.ca, in print and on newsstands, or by subscribing to The Walrus. You can also listen to our podcasts or take part in events just like this one here. And this work is made possible and powered by our donors, our supporters, and our partners. So, so just a big thank you to all of you for being a part of this conversation and making this event possible. Today's talks are going to focus on the relationship between art, culture, and civic engagement from the perspective of young artists and leaders. Our speakers are going to be exploring how arts and culture can be vital for communication and transformation, and how artists merge their creative work with a bigger commitment to social advocacy. They are crafting a new narrative for Canadian artists that promises to really leave a lasting impact on the cultural sector and society. So this is how the Walrus Talks at Home works. Each speaker has five minutes for their talk live, and then we follow that up with a moderated Q&A. This is where I come in, and our talkers, and you, our audience at home. So at any point tonight, if you have a question, post it in the comments, and I'll get to as many as possible. We also encourage you to share this event and conversation on social media. So take a picture and let us know how you're watching us tonight, or if there's something you hear that you really like, quote it and tweet it out. So I'll give you our handles. We're at The Walrus across social media, and you can also tag The Walrus Talks. A bit about our speakers. Tonight, we'll be hearing from live Selena Loy, founder and executive director, Flaunt It Movement. Selena McCallum, filmmaker, storyteller, and multimedia artist. Shand Bengal, community event organizer, Ontario Council of Agencies Serving Immigrants and Rising from Our Roots, as well as Joshua Chong, culture reporter at the Toronto Star. Thanks again to everyone for being a part of these talks. And we're going to start things tonight with Serena. Serena, welcome to The Walrus. Hello, my name is Serena Lai. I am a multidisciplinary artist, entrepreneur, scholar, and the founder of a youth-led social purpose organization called the Flaunt Movement. So we're known for using the arts to inspire civic engagement, but today we want to talk about our why. One of my greatest God-given gifts in this world is the ability to use the arts as a form of activism, as methods to ignite social change, as engagement activities that we all can share, and ultimately as a form of storytelling. I was born, raised, and reside in Toronto, Ontario's Jane and Finch community. And some of you listening may already have a preconceived notion if you hear Jane and Finch, but if you're unfamiliar, the media has painted it to be a quote-unquote unsafe, violent, ghetto place to live. But really, one, it's an intersection, but two, it's a low-income community with different socioeconomic standards. And I didn't realize how poorly people saw my home until I entered high school in a more affluent area to pursue an arts education. And in grade nine, I distinctly remember that when someone found out I was from Jane and Finch, they looked me in the eye and said, 
You're from Jane and Finch. Does that mean you own a gun? I continued to feel really belittled by my peers as they judged me and believed every negative thing they said on the news. An experience that my childhood friends shared whenever they stepped out of our local neighborhoods. Their ignorance was shaped by the media that constantly portrayed several highly racialized and underserved communities in this way. The thing is though, violence occurs all across Toronto. It's only intentionally framed to be worse in neighborhoods like Jane and Finch. But for us, these issues are the byproduct of poverty, systemic underinvestment, and inequity. In 2018, the previous Ward 7 city councillor, Giorgio Mammoliti, was interviewed on Press Progress and said, It's no wonder those little kids in those communities are growing up angry and killing people. I want to knock down all the social housing in Jane and Finch. And even though he lost the election, new developers knocked down acres of social housing anyway, proving that despite how dehumanizing those messages were, people agreed. And it pained me that the beautiful and vibrant community-driven spaces that I loved were being destroyed and our livelihoods were constantly being threatened. And the problem was that people who thought they knew us and thought they knew what was best for us assumed that they could start displacing and gentrifying our homes to essentially design a future without us. In 2021, Metrolux attempted to renege on its promise to donate land to our community hub space. So as you can see, there's a clear pattern of how our rights and humanity are disproportionately being erased over time. And this is why the Flaunton movement was born and continues to evolve. What started off as a photography series celebrating the beauty of Jane and Finch grew into a community organization. Flaunton Movement is a grassroots artist collective and social enterprise that fosters self-love, highly seen representation, and leadership opportunities for primarily racialized women and gender diverse folks in Northwest Toronto's low income communities. Our platform empowers our community to become self-actualized artists, activists, and entrepreneurs. Because for us, it's not just about taking action for the future generation, but also helping us currently because we refuse to be complacent. For each example that I mentioned, we responded with a video, a photo series, a poem, or some sort of art form to help us grasp the situation, respond accordingly, and spread awareness. See, because creative expression is one of the most accessible and inclusive languages in this world, helping people to better understand not only the importance of any given issue, but also the passion behind someone's advocacy. Our movement is rewriting the narratives that the media has placed upon us in order to ensure that we can tell our own stories. We collectively do this work to prove that grassroots advocacy is so powerful and to show that any community could take action too. Because in a society that doesn't want to see marginalized intersectional identities thrive, we are doing everything in our power to reimagine futures for one another. Futures where we can afford our homes, futures with revitalization informed by residents, futures that are shaped by the changes we make daily. Because there's that saying that goes, if we don't do it, who will? But for us, it's knowing that like, if we don't do it, someone else will, someone who doesn't know us. And I share these stories because there's not only power in telling stories, but there's power in witnessing them as well and holding space for them. And you can witness this work by getting involved in it and being a part of something larger than yourself. There's power in listening and learning from stories, just as I am grateful that you're taking the time to listen to mine. Because change is so much more attainable than we realize. If we can do it, you can too. You can be a part of a movement because simply caring can lead to contributions. Because again, this God-given gift of mine is something that you all have as well. Because it starts with building the capacity to support local before global. And I encourage you all to look around Support your neighbors, support the city that you call home, and help us fight for equity, collective justice, and ultimately, a better tomorrow. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Selena McCallum. I'm a filmmaker and storyteller. I was born in a neighborhood called Flemington Park in Toronto, and I was raised by my Tanzanian mom and my Jamaican dad. From a very young age, I love storytelling. I love books. I love the way that a book could transfer you into a world that you've never been to before, but now you feel like you know everything about. Um, and that is why I thought I was going to be an author. But I knew I wanted to connect to real life stories instead. 
So instead of pursuing literature or writing, I decided after grade 12 to pursue a double degree in journalism and film because of the power storytelling has to move people to emotion, change, and action. In, 20, in September 2015, one photo broke the hearts of many Canadians and all around the world as well. It was on the front page of many news outlets and websites. It urged us to stop, to focus, and to have real conversations. Some of you may already know what photo I'm talking about if you think back to September um, 2015. And because of the way it was etched in many people's lives and in many people's memories. Um, when the photograph of Alan Kurdi, a two-year-old Syrian boy who lay lifeless on the beach, made global headlines, this is what made us all stop and think. It was one photo. And as they say, a, a photo can speak a thousand words. I think this one said a lot more. And that is why photo journalism, documentaries, storytelling is so powerful to me and why it is why I wanted to pursue it so much because of the way it creates conversations that may, maybe we didn't think about before, but now we can extend and figure out what different perspectives we can think about. Um, so now we use photos and videos to tell stories more than ever before. More people would rather consume news on their phones than reading a physical paper. According to Insider Intelligence, a report by Paul Briggs predicted there will be 29.1 million digital video viewers in Canada this year, and that will climb to 30.1 million video viewers by 2026. And according to Made in CA, and on average, Canadians spend six hours and 35 minutes on the internet every day. And out of that time, two hours and five minutes are spent on social media, where most people are using social media on their handheld device. So the question I have is how can we add to this conversation of so many videos and photos being posted online and so many things and all the, and all the chaos of it all, what are we trying to say and what is our message? And that is why I love storytelling and documentary filmmaking, because we can take our handheld devices, our cameras, or whatever digital device we have and be able to share a story. Um, I, started, I started doing documentary filmmaking when I was in university, and one of my first films was on sex trafficking in Ontario and Michigan, and it looked to debunk the myths that happen around that. So the old narrative of you're walking down the street and someone pulls you into a white van is not the case. It's more of someone you know, someone you trust, and someone who kind of guides you down that path until it's too late and you're not sure how you even got into this situation. And so my film, Traffic on 401, was the, a film that I was glad to put online and to have other uh, men and women and children see this film and understand how it works and how human trafficking is in, is in Canada and not just in third world countries or globally. Um, another film I worked on is called Fitria, Muslim on and off the court. And this looked at how Muslim women who wear hijab can also play sports, can also be an, an athlete, a, a basketball player, um, and can also still be with their faith and want to have, and want to practice their faith. It's not to put, it's not to, for them to choose one or the other. It's for them to be able to be who they are, play the sport, but also not have to let go of their religion in the meantime. Um, and so both of these films mean a lot to me because I was able to connect with my subject and really ask them questions of why they do um, the things they do and why they want to play sports and why they also want to have their religion with them. And in this conversation, we were able to have other people who may not understand Islam or not or not understand basketball, really connect with Patria and see why she wanted to do both of these things. Um, in my film, Traffic on 401, I was able to connect, um, the survivor in my film was able to connect with people and to let her know her experience. It, it wasn't that she came from a broken home or um, you know, had terrible friends that guided her down this path. She came from a home that was loving, a two-parent home with siblings, but that is a situation she found herself in. And so with documentaries, storytelling, um, it allows us to see into another person's life. It allows us to understand and relate to each other in a way that we never were able to before. Um, and because of the use of more video and more photo, uh, we're able to connect on a deeper level. Um, and so this is why also this year I launched my documentary production company called Leverage Lens. So in early February, we had a film festival that showcased art and film and also allowed people to come and look at the photos around the wall and see how 
um, we're all relatable and we're all connected in a very in a way that we're able to see each other for who we are and what we want to express. And the three films were also made by Black emerging filmmakers who are, are new to filmmaking and given that platform to connect with the industry and connect with audiences as well. And through Leverage Lens, I also want to bring um, more representation, and that is by having panel discussions. So I'm also hosting a female cinematographers panel where usually females behind the camera don't get enough exposure and don't get and aren't able to tell their stories. And women in film itself were not that uh, portrayed in the forefront as many men are from before. And so this is another opportunity for more women to be in film. Um, and this is why I love what I do because storytelling and the power of storytelling allows us to connect with each other, allows us to relate to each other. And I think that with our handheld devices, if we're all able to add humanity to it, we can put out stories that, that matter. We can put out stories that showcase a cause and that also change the world just one photo or one video at a time thank you hi there my name is john bungle and i'm a content creator model community event organizer and creative director based in the peel region first off i want to thank walrus talk for having me i really appreciate this opportunity and i'm really looking forward to learning so much from this virtual talk I identify as a Punjabi Canadian woman and my artistic journey has been heavily impacted by a systemic erasure and loss of resources. A lot of Punjabi art is inaccessible or lost. In addition, there are a lack of opportunities and misogyny that hinder Punjabi women from pursuing the arts. With my artistic work, I hope to fill this gap and empower multiple generations of not only Punjabi individuals, but also South Asian individuals. The ethos behind my work is to build a diverse and inclusive artistic community in which we are not only empowering communities, but also encouraging racialized bodies to pursue artistic paths. Specifically, growing up in Canada, I've been able to access and utilize connections with other, uh, with other multicultural communities. Through these connections, my own understanding of the Punjabi diaspora has widely expanded. Punjab is known as the land of five rivers and Punjab, Punjab consists of diverse individuals due to migration, lack of employment and political conflicts. The Punjabi community has expanded beyond the land of five rivers to Fiji, West Indies and Caribbean and in some regions of Africa. However, due to a variety of reasons, a lot of Punjabi Canadians aren't aware of the true diversity of the Punjabi diaspora. In order to create art that is reflective of the Punjabi diaspora, I've been educating and connecting with diverse Punjabi ind individuals in order to appropriately represent the Punjab diaspora and the Punjabi community, specifically through building physical safe spaces, but also virtual safe spaces. Art and education are extremely powerful tools in order to build community, and I'm using art to make my community a more safer, diverse, and inclusive space. As a melanated Punjabi woman, I am often excluded from my own community, and in order to combat and challenge different societal norms, I use my art to educate and build solidarity. My own experiences of being ostracized and alienated isn't an, isn't an ex exclusive experience for me. My fellow Fijian, Indo-Caribbean, African, and mixed counterparts feel this as well. This alienation occurs because there is a lack of in, uh, education of indentured servitude, migration, and representation. Being in a leadership or mentor position has allowed me to expose younger audiences about the importance of using your voice to tackle issues such as anti, uh, such as colorism and anti-blackness. Within online spaces, I have been encouraging others to decolonize their minds because most of these issues that exist within the Punjabi community are a repercussion of colonialism. With the act of uh, exclusion, this can lead individuals to feel shame and resentment for their Punjabi roots and community. However, I recognize my own power and privilege as a Punjabi woman and create space for these individuals to take up space through my visual projects. The first step is acknowledgement. A lot of Punjabi diasporic individuals have rarely or never felt acknowledged by the Punjabi community. I had released a visual project in 2023 called Apne. Apne means our own in Punjabi and the project was dedicated to mixed Punjabi individuals. While on set, I kept refer referring to the models as Punjabins, which is a term used to describe Punjabi women. Um, one of the models had a revelation and she had stated that she had never referred to herself as strictly as Punjabi. She instinctively would always refer to herself as half and I reassured her and stated that she is Punjabi. I am extremely grateful to have been born and raised in Canada. I've been able to access databases, archives and individuals who have been able to educate and provide me with teachable moments about my own community. 
Due to colonization, there has been a domino effect of a lack of preservation and documentation regarding specifically the Punjabi, Punjabi history. However, through connections, educational opportunities, and an immense of research of my own, understand my, my own understanding of the Punjabi diaspora has greatly expanded. It really has been a learning journey, but art is empowerment, and I heavily encourage all South Asian women specifically to pursue the arts since we are widely underrepresented. Thank you. Hi, my name is Joshua Chong, and I'm a culture reporter with the Toronto Star. If you're a regular culture goer, you may have noticed your local arts company offering what's called a subscription a lineup of shows that are already curated and that you purchase as a package. Perhaps you're a subscriber yourself. It's a model that has existed for decades, offering arts organizations stability and predictability. Even before single tickets go on sale, these companies know they have a base attendance level according to the number of subscriptions already sold. But it's a model that almost across the board in North America is dying. It's an issue that predates the pandemic but it's been drastically exacerbated by it. Coupled with other issues like lack of, lack of financing and donations, this shift in consumer behavior has led to an industry-wide crisis with some companies canceling programming or winding up entirely. Perhaps the most glaring example of this in Canada is the Kitchener-Waterloo Symphony, which filed for bankruptcy last year. But in some cases, this move away from the traditional subscription model has presented a once in a generation opportunity, a nudge for companies to scrutinize what they're presenting and to expand their offerings for a wider audience. But first, what has caused this decline in the subscription model, you may ask? Well, it's largely due to a confluence of factors, most notably changing consumer habits. Research has shown audiences are less loyal to arts companies and are putting off purchasing tickets until later, driven in part by economic headwinds and a general pullback in discretionary spending. Simply put, with the rise of streaming services throughout the pandemic, people have more options about how they want to spend a Saturday evening and are less willing to commit their time and money to one activity. This is being felt by companies large and small across the sector. With the exception of Mervish in Toronto, whose commercial programming continues to resonate with subscribers, the companies and arts leaders that I've spoken with across the GTA in my work say the subscription model is unsustainable and not a path forward. For these companies with the subscriber base that's shrinking, it's presented an opportunity and a chance to look at how they program their works. By and large, subscriber audiences tend to skew wealthier, older, and are typically more white than the general demographic. Arts companies that relied on the subscriber audience to finance their seasons would typically cater their programming for that audience. What did that look like? It typically meant programming works that were safe, with broad appeal, perhaps that may elicit a sense of nostalgia. Think of the jukebox musicals and film-to-stage adaptations that are at, programmed at some commercial theaters. With the loss of the subscriber base, however, arts companies aren't targeting that audience anymore, and that has led to a shift in programming. Many companies now realize they need to rely more on single ticket buyers, including younger audiences. Companies, as a result, are taking bigger risks in what they're mounting. We've seen eclectic programs, even more immersive experiential shows in the past few years. Take the Canadian author company in Toronto, for instance. A decade ago, their season may have been comprised of their big title operas. But if you look at their upcoming season, only one of their six operas, Madame of Butterfly, ranks among the top 10 produced operas in the world. The average age of their audience, meanwhile, is about a decade lower than compar comparable opera companies across North America. These changes are also leading to greater diversity in the voices being programmed. We're seeing companies like the Canadian Opera Company and Canadian Stage invest further in original works, world premieres. I doubt these opportunities would have been available under a subscriber model. It risked alienating audiences. And, and finally, the demise in the model can also offer greater flexibility in terms of programming, especially at a time when some companies are struggling financially and cannot commit to a full slate of shows in advance. For instance, look at Soul Pepper in Toronto which last year chose to unveil its season in a series of acts broken down into several months. 
Ultimately, this shift in consumer behavior is really moving these larger companies in line with their independent counterparts. Indie theaters across North America traditionally have never relied on subscriber audiences. With the additional freedom and flexibility to program what they want and not trying to cater to a certain audience, indie theaters are where some of the most daring, challenging, and innovative work happen. Could we see this at larger stages too? With this move away from the subscriber model, spurred by what could be considered a crisis in the industry, I believe so. So what I hope you take away from this talk is that companies are recognizing now the need to, for their audiences, the needs of their audiences, and are more attentively listening to what they want to see on stages. And ultimately, that's beneficial for the art form. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. Uh, just to recap, we just heard from Serena Loy. Selena McCollum, Chen Bengal, and just now Joshua Chung. Thank you all for your thoughtful talks, expertise, and giving us a lot to think about. Okay, we're going to open this up to our audience at home. I want to check in with all of you joining us this evening. Let us know where you are. Or where are you tuning in from? Okay, I'm going to take a look. We have audience members registered from all over. Hello, Montreal, Calgary. Wealth, Whitehorse, Ottawa, Gatineau, Kamloops, Vancouver, Halifax, Little Pine, First Nation, coast to coast to coast. As well, welcome to audience members who are joining us internationally. Hello to people tuning in from Omaha, Nebraska, New York City, and hello, Cleveland. Okay, a reminder as we get into the Q&A portion, if you have a question, you can just submit it in the chat. I'm now going to welcome back our talkers to turn their cameras back on as we move into the Q&A session. Uh, thank you all. Wow. Uh, so much to get to. I'm going to start with a few questions that I have, and then I'll move into audience questions. The first question I have might seem basic, but I think it's an important, which is how you each see art or culture. I think a lot of people are often intimidated or wonder, like, am I am I an artist? Am I am I creating art? So I'd love just to get a a sense of what art is. And uh, Chand, I'm going to start with you. I saw you nodding there. Like when when you encourage people to be artists, like what is art? What are you encouraging them to do? How do we define it? I've actually been talking a lot about the importance and impact of art specifically. I'm so sorry. My dog is working. I don't know <laughs> we love can... dogs. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if anybody can pick it up, but but I think art most specifically is it can be resistance. It can be story. It could be a story. It could be even history specifically um, empowerment. Like it, art itself is so powerful because it's long lasting. Like the longevity of it is going to surpass even your own lifetime. So whatever you create and whatever time that you're blessed with on this earth, that art is going to surpass even time. And like time takes up space. It takes up physical space. So that's very powerful as well, because I know that Selena specifically talked about the over access to content and how it can lead to overstimulation and even um, what type of content are we consuming, right? Because um, the, we have to be very intentional with the content that we consume because that's going to take up space in our physical beings and even our own mental spaces. So we have to be really intentional with the content that we consume. And that's why it's so important to make out, um, to create intentional art, but also art that has um, a deeper intention or a deeper purpose of just being pretty, basically. Mm, Selena, jump in there. Yeah, we can talk about content, <clears throat> everything on our phones, and then what determines if it's art. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so, um, so much for the reference there. And I definitely believe creating art that exceeds your lifetime is so important to do. Um, my favorite poet, Randella J. He once said in his poetry that, uh, "What does a dash mean between your?" between your birth year and your, your death year. And what did you bring to that? And what happened towards that in your lifetime? And I always refer to that when I'm, whenever I'm creating content or whenever I'm talking to someone or they, I'm trying to think about the impact I'm, I wanna make, um, what do I wanna leave behind? And what do I what do I want that dash in between to say about me and my life, but also people around me and my community and everything like that. So I think film and photo and video is one way that we communicate nowadays. And even from like, back in the 1900s where people or you know 1900s but you know decades ago where people had their like um their cameras and they were just 
um, creating family videos of birthdays and special moments. And I think we've always loved to do that. And I'd love for people to continue to use their photos, use their videos, but for a different cause to to share more stories and share more emotion with people and be vulnerable. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. And that that's what art is to me, vulnerability. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what makes it so hard in many ways, right? To be, mm-hmm. be vulnerable. Uh, Serena, I would love to bring you, you in and hear th- thoughts on like what determines art, but especially as it connects to civic engagement, because there's commercial art, right? There's art, maybe you could find an advertisement, but then civic engagement feels like an elevated level of art. Yeah, for sure. And like, I I really resonate with what John John and Selena were just mentioning too. I feel like this whole idea of like art being a legacy, like I feel like to me and my lifestyle and my practice is art like light art is literally life to me (laughs) like art is literally a part inherently who i am like it's a part it's a practice to me it's a it's so integrated in my being but like there's with all this like conversation that we're having even about like uh, that this idea like what we're leaving behind um for flante we actually produce a biannual visual anthology which is like a a basically a collection of art and stories from over over hundreds of like black indigenous women fans on binary folks of color from all across Turtle Island. Um, so we are going to be actually releasing the call for our next mission or, or the call for our next issue actually very soon in this month. But the theme we're exploring is actually um, a black foot, a black Blackfoot um, indigenous like study or theory that's called like cultural perpetuity. So it's this understanding that you will be forgotten, but you have a part in ensuring that you're people's important teachings live on. And I love that so much because this idea too of thinking about like what is going to live beyond us. Another really um another quote that I love that I love to remind myself of is that like the objective isn't to live forever, but to create something that will. And I do think that like art is inherently how we are able to do these type of things, right? And thinking about like what is our what is the contributions that we get to make on a day-to-day basis? Well, how are what how are we going to engage with one another in a way that's accessible, inclusive, and so on? And I feel like art just has been that thing, that medium that has allowed us to do all of these things, to dismantle all those barriers, and to be able to engage in ways that I don't think any other medium will be able to do truly. So yeah, I feel like just art is. It's such a big question, but I do think it's just so, and it's such an inherent part of our beings. Mm. I love that idea of the, the idea of how art is what lives on after we leave. And uh, perhaps this sounds saccharine, but but I like to think that beyond, besides love, art is the greatest gift that we can give each other. Um, and I'm really interested in the definition of art as well as a culture report. I'm always grappling what is art, especially in our city. And I think what I've noticed is that over time, over the decades, we're really expanding the notion and the idea of what art is and how it animates our spaces and our cities. Um, Decades ago, for example, um, street art, many people wouldn't consider street art art. It was considered, you know, graffiti. But but now look at Toronto, the investments being made in street art and how these pop-up spaces can be used to animate the city and animate the people that live in our city. Um, and we're also doing a, a delineation within art itself, I believe, of, of genres. And, and it's so hard nowadays for me, like when I see a piece of art on stage, is this a piece of theater? Is this film? And we're really seeing artists kind of, you know, blending and and breaking these conventions. I think that's all for the best in terms of art and kind of pushing these genres and these um, boundaries even further. Mm, I love it. Okay, I'm going to ask a direct but a very honest question. Do you feel youth are encouraged enough to get into the arts and to support the arts? I say that in an honest way just because a lot of parents are kind of focused on a job that pays or a job that they know and teachers too, right? Or like, do you feel there is support for youth in the arts? Um, I can jump in on this question. Uh, I think it's shifting, but we're definitely not there yet in terms of seeing art as a consistent flow 
of income as a stable career. It's more of like, you can do your art and we'll support you, but have something else, you know, or, but have a backup plan. And most artists, you know, art is our front plan or backup plan or our whole entire plan. We don't really want to do anything else but that. And so I think it's like people do support and when families, I can talk about my my parents did have supported me throughout my whole art career. Um, but my mom has also said, like, you need a stable job. You need a stable job. And I have one. It's in an art uh, organization, which is amazing. But at the same time, it's like before years ago, like my mom wanted me to be a lawyer and was pushing me in that direction instead of being an author. And you know, and kind of like, yeah, you can write and you can make your films, but think more about like how you're going to live in the future and save for retirement. And these are questions that I know artists still think about today, especially the saving beyond, you know, and having more of an income later on. So, um, yeah, I think it's like, we're not fully there yet as seeing art as like our career. Um, And it's funny because I actually had a conversation this this morning at work about art being seen as a hobby and not as a career. And so I think I'd love to change that perspective in all communities that art is a career and and not a hobby. Um, So, yeah. Uh, Just to even build off of that, um, I think it's not like a matter of support. I think it's like a matter of like belief and confidence and self-esteem because a lot of in order to pursue anything creative or anything artistic, you really need to have strong confidence with you and your vision and whatever. You could be a writer, you could be a painter, you could be a director. Like you really need to have that self-confidence and that self-belief in you in order to put yourself out there because putting making art is a very vulnerable path. It's just a very vulnerable journey. Um, so I think specifically with youth, um, they struggle to even like believe in themselves that they can be a director while working their nine to five or they can um be a successful artist um full time and whatnot but i don't think that's like selena mentioned like uh, there is like that um i wouldn't say it's a stigma but like that belief that pursuing the arts isn't um considered considered serious or stable enough um my second part to that answer is specifically I'm a daughter of immigrants and my parents came to Canada, like a typical immigrant story came to Canada with like $50 and now they are living in Brenton suburbia with a beautiful home. And I think specifically the reason why there's that, um, I guess like friction is because specifically like my parents are very supportive of me and whatever I do, but a lot of uh, parents, even of like, creative friends that I have aren't and it's because specifically when you have immigrant parents when you have two immigrant parents you could have one or two or whatever but they come here in survival mode and that's why they have this um thought or this mindset that you need like a stable career that's like an engineer lawyer doctor or like is a nine to five um the nine to five is like holy grail especially with benefits like they think like you made it like you're set for life but um like Selena mentioned, like anything that's art is considered side, like a side hustle or like a side job or like a passion project or anything. Um, but I think the reason why, specifically from a parental perspective, why there's a lack of support, I would I would say specifically in the Punjabi community. I know it's very common in racialized communities, but I don't want to want to speak on behalf of that. But specifically in the Punjabi community, there is this. Um, it's a very strong mentality. It's a very much so majority of parents think that um, pursuing the arts isn't a, like a career. It, like a lot of them, like you could be making six figures and they're like, when are you going to get a real job? Or like, that's not going to last you very long. Or when you got, what's your 40, what's your 40 year plan or whatnot. So like, they're always thinking of the future. And also like the end goal is always like to have a house, to have um, a car in your name, to have like all these tangible things, um, tangible things in your life take up space but it's very hard for them to think like very fluidly like it's very hard for them to think of life in a different perspective because um they've been forced of this canadian uh, not forced but they've kind of just developed and um uh normalize this canadian dream that this is this is the dream when you have a house um when you have like a really good pension or retirement plan um when you have enough savings or whatnot like it's really much so about like numbers and metrics when you've done all of that that's good so um I definitely think it's 
it's an internal and it's also an external battle when it comes to like supporting youth and the arts. So there are different like elements to it. Now we have a lot of audience questions coming in, so I'm going to get to those. Sean asks, what kind of opportunities for artists would you like to see happen? And I'm going to direct that one to Joshua because you were talking about the changing business model and uh, also the opportunities for artists and, and new artists coming in the mix. So I'd be curious as someone who covers this, what would you like to see? Yeah, I can't speak to this personally because I'm not an artist, but in some of my reporting, what I've heard is that it's become incredibly unaffordable to be an artist in Toronto and any of these big entertainment industries. We saw a, a drain of artists throughout the pandemic. People who left the industry um, went back to university, went back to college to do different jobs, enter a new field of work. I think what's really missing in terms of opportunities is full-time work, um, especially in arts management and arts programming. Um, there are tons of, you know, these fantastic, and I wouldn't write them off, fantastic internship opportunities, fantastic contract work, fantastic gig opportunities as well. But when I speak with artists and people in arts management or people who are making the shift from an artist and want to go into kind of programming, they often tell me, yes, there is a way in for me. There are these internship opportunities that are funded by these really generous organizations, philanthropists. But beyond that, what is the path forward? And there seems to be a lack of a pipeline. Um, and I think that's a real issue. And that's what's leading to um, people being disenfranchised with the industry right now and reading the industry. And that ultimately hurts the artist's self when you don't have these pathways, um, when you don't have these um, strong structures for programming and the people um, that work around the art that ultimately harms the art itself. And we're seeing that a lot of organizations, venerable organizations that have been so successful over the years that are struggling right now with that question of how do we support our artists and offer them uh, a, a livable wage to live in the city. Um, I see arts postings all the time and people share them with me on like LinkedIn and all that that are telling me how can people live in Toronto with this wage um, for a full-time 40-hour job that, that pays less than $45,000. Um, for many, it's, it's kind of impossible. Serena, I want to in invite you in. We have a question for from an audience member, Sedina. What would you say was your biggest barrier to entry to the world of making art and the way that you make it? Did you run Ooh. into uh, barriers as you got into it? <laughs> Yeah, our biggest barrier. And I, I feel like I just resonate with so much of what was being said. I'm like, oh, there's so much to talk about. But like, I guess my biggest barrier def definitely was like the socioeconomic differences I talked a lot about. Um, again, like our, my biggest thing and why I had to go to an arts high school, which was like an hour away from home, I commuted to every day for four, like, for four years of my life, was because I didn't have any of that available in my community. Um, you know, my same thing with my family and my parents are refugees, you know, us coming like we, us living in a low income family, too. Um, just the fact that like me commuting to a whole other neighborhood made me realize how starkly different income differences can make to, to get, can make a role or take a role in your life in terms of pursuing the arts. I went to high school with people who have been able to pursue like professional dance since the age of three and like, you know, had money to all of these, the equipment and the supplies and everything. And I was only able to ask that because of the high school I went to, right? Like, because like this arts high school gave me this opportunity to do that. But when I look back to my homeschool and my, in, in Jane and Finch, um, like the most that they had for extracurriculars were like sports or like student council and so on. So when we are not given these type of opportunities, then you, you that are not given like basically you they're not given the opportunity to then explore and then see what like you know what they're capable of what their potentials are and so on and i used to always say to a youth in our community too it's like it's not a lack of talent or potential it's just a lack of investment in our community so i think that was our biggest thing and that's why like flaunted does so much of the work that we do where like everything we do is really about building this platform to provide these resources and opportunities for artists so that we could all collectively learn again, how do we build a career out of this? How do we build income out of this? How do we make sure that we could like really create jobs out of being an artist? I'm really privileged and really grateful to say that I am a full-time artist now, but that took a lot. 
it took a lot of jumping over a lot of barriers and so on um and really making sure that i was demanding space in different rooms um that didn't want me there because of maybe either my gender because of my national my ethnicity because of my again my age my income background and so on um and making sure that if i could have this opportunity to hopefully pave the way to, for more for more artists like me to also be in these spaces then we got to do this work right um so yeah like socioeconomic barriers were definitely a huge one but I think like like everyone talked about too, art is such a there's no linear pathway to do the work that we do. And you could you could either really embrace that or be really terrified of it. Maybe both, that's okay. But knowing that like there is also really vibrant arts communities out there where we're all really genuinely here to support each other and making sure that we reach our best potential. Mm, thank you for that. This is from Maria, an interesting question. The UN Declaration of Human Rights reinforces the fundamental right to leisure, yet promoting and supporting art is costly. Do you feel the high costs of accessing it are an issue? So that's kind of one extreme, but I'd also love for any of you to speak to where arts might be more accessible. Uh, so who wants to kick that off? Yeah, I, I definitely agree, especially in in Canada, but we're seeing a shift as well. Just like the subscription model, we're seeing a shift in pricing as well, because companies are starting to recognize that if it's not accessible financially, um, they are not going to be able to attract the younger generation of audiences. But this has been an issue um, across the board, especially for the performing arts, which I cover extensively. Um, a lot of times that is impacting who is getting to see the theater. Um, and, and it's predominantly, if you look at the companies that, that charge incredibly high prices that are is inaffordable, um, the audiences are typically older, they're typically white, and that kind of feeds into the cycle that I was talking about, the subscription model, that if companies start relying on those audiences and those are the only people that are coming into their theaters, that's who they're going to be programmed that works for. And that kind of leads to a bit of an alienation in terms of um, audiences from different socioeconomic statuses who may not be able to access that work. And for the artists themselves who are on stage. Um, so it's a, it's a difficult cycle to get out of, but we're seeing quite a lot of innovation on that front as well. A lot of companies now, even your bigger companies like the ballet companies, their your opera companies are offering discounted tickets to, to youth. Um, and the question is now is whether they've started too late. Um, whether they're able to really fill that gap as there's the, the attrition in audiences, as people are shifting away to, to other media, whether they're able to, to really engage these audiences who have been kept out for so long because of the, the, the price barrier. Um, and I think that Canada can learn a lot from, from other countries, Europe especially, um, even the UK, um, I was there in, in, in London a few months ago, and I was so surprised that the museums in, in London are all free, free access for anyone, um, British citizens, uh, international tourists. Um, and you just look at the people who are there and who are engaging with this culture. Um, it's very different than, than perhaps what you would see um, here in Toronto. Um, and I think that inclusivity price-wise is, is plays such an important role. It's not, it's not the key factor. You also have to look at programming and all that, but I think that's a continues to be a huge barrier here in the Canadian arts and culture scene. That's why I love public and street art, because you can just see people walking by, pausing, interacting with it, taking photos, and then that secondary audience when you share online. So I want to come to Selena with this next question, because it is about evolving technology. Carol asks, how do you think AI and deep fakes might affect online journalism, photography, and videos vis-a-vis -vis conspiracies or negative activism based on hate? So you spoke to the like the power of a photograph. How about if that photo is fake? That is a very amazing question. And because AI is so predominant now in everything we do, there's like ChatGBT, for example, where it's writing literally essays for students at this point. Um, I think the way that we can fight, fight we're not so fight it, but kind of engage with it and figure out how to navigate through this is by making sure we have fact checkers, making sure that there are people who are able to 
know what is real and what is fake and creating, if there's an AI to create something that's fake, there should be an AI to kind of um, debunk what that was made from. So I think there is like already programs in schools where a professor is allowed to put an essay through something and know if it was written by ChatGBT. I feel like if there isn't already, there should be the same kind of thing for fo photographs and videos. Um, and when we look at deep fakes and videos and people putting on someone else's face on another character for a video, either like for hate or for something completely horrible. Um, I think that's where we can bring in like um, laws and we can bring in social justice and make sure that the people that are behind that, even if they're, you know, hiding behind their computer screens, they're hiding behind codes and, and they're hackers and, 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 and whatnot. Um, we're able to bring them to justice by really looking at what what are the digital laws that we have now and do they match up with what we're seeing today? For example, when we had um, the ongoing of cyberbullying and that was a topic many years ago, there wasn't any laws to really cover what was happening online and it was almost laughed at to see like, well, why don't you just turn your computer off? Why don't you just turn your laptop off? Um, and I think it took so much like time and it took so much Advo um, advocacy from people online to say cyberbullying is a real thing and we need laws to match up with this for because children are losing their lives and they're taking their lives because of it. Um, and so I think going forward with AI, it's just making sure we have fact checkers programs to debunk it and we have our laws match up so that when this becomes a terrible thing and it's ruining people's lives, we're able to kind of fight, fight it online and, and in person. So. Building yeah. off that, I have a question for Joshua and then a final question that I'll ask to all of you. Joshua, especially from your arts cult and culture coverage, what is the role of new technology, whether it's streaming services, virtual reality, and making it easier for the public to ask, access tech? We saw a lot of experimentation during the lockdowns with Zoom and like even just coming together in new ways, very different than traditional theater. Well, I'll talk within the context of theater and the performing arts and, and really throughout the pandemic, starting in 2020, we saw these companies, I don't really like using the word, but pivot um, to, to virtual offerings and offerings online. Um, and I've attended a range of them with some of them better than others, but um, it's been really interesting to see how the art translates from a live space where the art is happening in front of you to an online medium. Oftentimes it is being live streamed. Um, and the innovation that has been done in that time, sometimes it's it's uh, at the start of the pandemic, I remember it was just as simple as like a Zoom setup. Um, but now there's completely new technology to help with the streaming and, and the way of broadcasting it. And, and what's interesting is that when it started in 2020, I thought, oh, this is just a stopgap measure. And then once theaters reopen, um, we'll be done with this. But the really interesting thing is that we've seen companies continue with these hybrid models in parallel. Companies like um, Against the Grain Theater, an opera company, for example, they have their in-person works and also hybrid productions that, uh, virtual productions that are designed specifically for, for a, a, a Zoom setting. Um, and I think that's a fantastic way of engaging audiences who may not otherwise go to the theater or have, don't have access to it. Um, there was a recent study that came out, um, uh, Nick Nano's uh, a quarterly survey on arts and culture in Canada. And the second biggest barrier to accessibility um, when, when money is not a factor is location and people not being able to access it. So I think this democratization that technology has offered is incredibly beneficial. Um, and the way that we're able to engage with cultures and art that may not be in our backyard. Um, I'll give you the example, for example, the Sydney Festival. Um, I was just speaking with their artistic director who's coming to Toronto, in fact, it's the new AD of Luminato. Um, their festival programming is um, virtual, was virtual, was filmed, and is accessible around the world. And I know there's so many other institutions if you care to look around the world that offer free programming that's online that you can access from your living room in Canada. And I think that's a fantastic way of offering art and sharing these ideas to people and, and, around and the world. And to travel, yeah, and to actually travel. Yeah. Uh, final question, and with an eye on time, if you could answer it 
three to five words, just kind of like a, a final offering for our audience. How can they, how can we best support artists? And I chose the word artists intentionally, not just art, because people are behind the art that we're talking about. So we'd love to start with you, Chand. How can we best support artists? Um, I think there's two ways of doing this. Go to galleries and exhibits that highlight new and emerging and specifically racialized artists because it's really hard to get into an exhibit. It's really hard to even hold your exhibit. It's very expensive. The second thing is um, buy their stuff. So uh, specifically, Serena mentioned that Flaunit released a visual anthology, purchasing visual anthologies, uh, purchasing per uh, photo books, prints, monetarily funding because there is a lack of funding and it's very com competitive to get funding. Actually putting like your coin and your dollar into supporting artists goes definitely a long way. Trust me, it makes everyone's day, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. I also love the shout out to Serena. So Serena yeah, already... I love, I love you so much. No, I actually met Tron at our visual anthology launch um, back in November. So I love that. So I appreciate you for sure. No, um, I always say artists are inherently creative entrepreneurs. We can't we can't do this work without calling ourselves an entrepreneur at the same time. So yes, support local, support local and hire us, buy from us. Um, this uh, saying it's like surround yourself with people who will like put your name, like we'll say your name in different rooms. Like if please like refer us, amplify us, like do this type of stuff to empower us because it could go a long way. Like even us being all here today, we're really, I know I'm personally very honored to be part of this panel, but I know that's like from just the love I know that we have from folks on the Wars team who've been able to invite me to be part of this work. So please like think of us in a different way. Just, it's this because the same I mentioned in my 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 talk, which is support local from before global, which is a saying that actually um, an artist and like a grassroots organizer named Nathan Baia says a lot in his work, for, which he has an organization called Jane Street Speaks. So he says, yeah, support local before global because you know your dollar will go so much further, and you can see where your dollar goes when you really do that. When you really the support connection, them. the connection. Sorry to have to cut yeah. you off, but I want to hear from Selena, then Joshua. Thank you so much, Selena. Um, I'm going to echo both Chan and Serena. Definitely attend galleries, buy our artwork, um, see what we're up to, stay updated, follow us on social media, uh, things like that. Comment, like. Um, it definitely helps in person and online when you're engaging with us and also sharing uh, our posts, sharing our poems, creating a film, going to a screening, sharing that film with someone else. Um, those are definitely ways you can continue to help us as artists and can push artists as well to help other artists. So, yeah. Thank you. A good reminder, engage on social media. You can all be found on social. And Joshua. Three quick things. See the art that you would otherwise never thought that you would ever see. Engage with the artists after seeing the art. Reach out to them. They're fantastic people. And three, keep the conversation going by talking about the art that you've seen, whether you like it or dislike it, with your friends, with your family, um, and just talk about art more. Mm, that's the whole point. That's the whole point. Thank you again, uh, Serena Aloy, uh, Selena McCollum, Sean Bunkle, and Joshua Chung. And thanks to our audience. If you enjoyed today's event, we have another one coming up in two weeks. The Walrus Talks Nature here in Toronto, but also online. Again, this is something we've continued from lockdowns. We have leaders from Canada's climate, business, and nonprofit sectors coming together to discuss the value of nature and access to nature, trails, uh, you know, connecting us across the country. Also, keep an eye on your inbox. You're going to receive an email from us as a follow-up. If you'd like to attend future events like this one, and hopefully you will stay in touch with us by opting into our newsletter. You can also check in with us at thewalrus.ca slash events. That's where we keep our schedule. We also will post the videos from tonight's talks, so you can share that as your call to action. The Walrus is home to Canada's community-supported conversation. That means our journalism, our events are made possible by people like you. As a registered charity with an educational mandate, the Walrus relies on your support to power independent, fact-based journalism and thought-provoking events like this one. So if you enjoyed this free event, join our community of donors in supporting Canada's conversation. Donate to the Walrus at thewalrus.ca slash donate to ensure that we can continue creating stories that matter to you. A big thank you to our annual sponsors, Air Canada, Inspire, RBC Emerging Artists, Rogers, and Via Rail. And thanks, everyone. 
let's continue that conversation about art. Have a great evening.